welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Tony Ribbing, the CEO of Sustainable Seas Trust, just to give us a few opening words this morning. Thank you, Tara, and welcome to everyone. It's in fact indeed a privilege for me to welcome you on behalf of the Waste Free Oceans, Sustainable Seas Trust and Plastics SA and others who are going to be participating in this meeting today. I'm actually delighted that Waste Free Oceans extended and reached out to us because this North-South collaboration is hugely important. It's also really worrying in terms of the scale and the growth of the global pollution that many organizations are working in isolation because the issues are so large that and so frightening that it is a time for us to actually to collaborate. The, the problems are too big for any one organization and indeed any one nation. So we really are delighted that uh, Waste Free Oceans lends out to us and we, we can collaborate. We feel that the Northern Hemisphere has got skills and expertise and experience that we in Africa desperately need. And so we look forward very much to further collaborating, not only with World Waste Free Oceans, but others in Europe too. We in Africa, of course, also have our own sets of problems and our own ways of finding the, the, the solutions and meeting challenges. So there is, in fact, a wonderful way for us to um, share our successes too. And so again, the North-South relationship is going to be of benefit, not only to those of us involved, but since the issues are global, I think we can have a positive impact much further than just Africa and Europe. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we've, it means we've got lots to discuss and more to do. And if one thinks about it, it really is time to act. There's a sense of urgency. And Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's the senior patron of SST, says that this is probably the most important decade in human history, much more important than any that's gone in the past and probably most more important than any in the future, because it's in a way the last opportunity. She says that what we do now or what we fail to do will have ramifications for thousands of years. I think she's correct. If we were to act wisely and decisively, then we will be able to ensure that the humans can remain and have a future on this planet. I don't know if you realize it, but 2021 is also a very important decade for other reasons too. It's the United Nations Decade for Ocean Science and Sustainable Development. And high on that agenda is the protection of ocean life support system, systems. And when we are looking at this, plastics and other forms of pollutions play a hugely important role. So if we can work together to reduce that pollution, that would be fantastic. This is also a year that alerts us to the fact that the nations of the world have only 10 years left. So it really is an important decade, only 10 years left to meet the sustainable development goals before the 2030 deadline for the agenda for sustainable development. And that is crucial. So the pressure is on and the sort of collaboration that we're talking about today is imperative and it's mounting. It means we must plan together, we must act together. And again, we think that the North-South collaboration that's epitomized in today's webinars is vitally important in setting the platform for essential collaboration. Today, both sessions focus on treating plastic waste as a resource, namely the development through enterprises of the recycling and repurposing entrepreneurial activities. And they need to then produce marketable products. And in that way, they of course provide downstream services, but upstream too, there is a great benefit because the fact that the enterprises create a demand for used plastics in Africa in particular, it's, it's important. They provide incentives to collect and sell materials creating employment on the one hand, but then on the other, they're contributing to cleaning environments. So that, that is marvelous. Today, we have excellent speakers who are going to lead the discussions and we're most fortunate and grateful. So I thank all of you who are attending and in particular, I thank the speakers 
for taking the time to share knowledge and thoughts with us and to also encourage and invite you to, to collaborate further in this sort of relationship. And one of the avenues for that is for you to note that this time next year, the 23rd to the 27th of May, is the Towards Zero Plastics to the Seas of Africa conference. What we start today, let's continue next year uh, in, in this week. You shall you all get invitations to that. So have a very good session. We hope to have excellent discussions today. Tara, thank you for the opportunity to welcome the people and to indicate that what we do today and what we're starting today can have ramifications well beyond this today's webinars. So back to you, Tara. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. Um, that, it's a great, great way to start off today's session. Uh, before we launch into the first presentation, um, I think if we can just have each of the panelists who are with us today um, introduce themselves. Uh, so the way that you're um, uh, listed in the program, Maria, Chris, and then Soren, if you could just briefly introduce yourselves um, so that we know who you are and where you're joining us from, uh, then we'll go into the presentation. Okay, let me start first. My name is Maria, Maria Domanaki. I'm based in London, but I am now locked down in Greece for the moment, at least. Um, I, I, in my previous life, I have been a politician. I have been a European commissioner for marine issues. I have worked uh, in uh, the States with the Nature Conservancy as a global director. Now I'm working with the Paradise Foundation China and with uh, Systemic, which is a, a big uh, firm uh, for sustainability in London as an advisor. So I have, ex I have some experience around the sea. Uh, I was born next to the sea, so you can imagine that sea is in my heart. I'm very happy to join you today because I believe this is a great issue and uh, I, I hope I can show you later on why Africa is so important for all of us. I would like to thank all of you for sparing some time, some of your valuable time with us. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And I would like to thank Tony who opened uh, this webinar, uh, giving us a push for an adventure that will have a future. And I hope I can be with you next year, all of you. This is from me, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris White. Um, I've been involved in sustainability, greening, pretty much everything for as long as I can remember. I've uh, been involved in uh, a number of different initiatives. Um, I got involved with uh, the NPO sector in 2009 through an organization called Use It. Um, still doing some fantastic work in, in the sector with regards to looking at waste beneficiation. Um, but I'm looking at different applications at the moment now, so my focus is going uh, pan-African and global, um, looking at the development of systems and opportunities in terms of uh, transitioning Africa to a circular economy, uh, using waste as a resource. I'm uh, currently director on the executive team of the African Circular Economy Network and the chapter lead for South Africa. Um, just launched uh, new offices in Rotterdam and Brussels, um, looking at project development from the ASIN Foundation uh, to look at closer linkages with Europe, um, as well as one of the uh, founding members of Holistic Technologies, which is a global think tank um, with 35 specialists across the world who are looking at uh, trying to find solutions that will save the planet. So um, here, Again, I'm gonna focus more on the waste, on the waste plastic side of things. Um, I'm also a, uh, um, an advisor to the African Marine Waste Network. So always happy to be here with, uh, with the family and looking forward to the discussions. Um, but my apologies, I've got to rush from this into another television interview and then I'll be back for a few questions and then I'm off to another meeting in Europe. So um, I'll be in and out if you don't mind, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Soren? Yeah, hi. Yeah, my background is a little uh, different. I'm from uh, Denmark. 
Uh, I'm elected two years ago. I was elected to the European uh, Parliament. Before that, I was uh, CEO of the Danish Food and a Cultural Council. I've been in politics in my home country. I've been Minister of Defence for some years. Uh, my interest in, um, in this uh, very important topic about waste in our oceans is that I'm a vice chair in the PETS committee. I'm, uh, I live very close, I mean, next to uh, the ocean. I'm elected in an area where fishing is very important. I lived in the Middle East during the first Gulf War. I lived uh, close to the Mediterranean. I've seen uh, how devastating it is with all the plastics into our seas. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm driven, you know, trying to, to make a difference as a politician because I think this is, uh, this is very important and I'm very impressed to hear my, my uh, fellow uh, colleagues in, in the panel because I mean, I'm, I'm maybe not into all details, but then I can try to, to listen and take something into, into the political level. So that's my background. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Soren. Um, our fourth panelist, uh, Anna B. Pretorius, has just joined us. Anna B., can you please just introduce yourself, just sort of who you are and where you're joining us from? Thank you so much, and, and my apologies for, for joining um, only now. Um, I'm um, independent, uh, Plastics 911, um, and um, on an annual basis, I'm responsible to collect the statistics um, for Plastics SA on plastics recycling. Um, and that um, actually necessitates that I visit um, most of the recyclers. We have about 300 independent plastic recyclers in South Africa. And I try to visit at least each of them once every three years. Um, so yeah, I think it gives me a, a good understanding of, of the plastics industry and plastics recycling in South Africa. And, and that would be where I'm coming from for today's discussions. Great. Thank you, Anabi. Uh, for, from here, we're going to go into Maria's presentation. Um, and just to note that Maria also um, won't be able to stay with us for the Q&A session at the end. So if you do have any questions you would specifically like to direct to her, please send those through um, during her presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll pull up the slides now. Thank you very much, Tara. Can I see the first slide, please? Great. So let me say a few words first about blue economy. I know that I'm speaking to an audience that is familiar with all this, but let me just repeat and underline some facts. So blue economy is very, very important for all of us, but um, we have to realize that uh, blue uh, economy is very important for the world as a whole. Just to mention that if the oceans were a country, they would thus constitute the seventh largest economy in the world. Some people actually argue that it will be the fifth economy, but okay, it will be between the fifth and the seventh economy around the world. So we cannot ignore the blue economy. And we cannot ignore the blue economy for Africa because Africa is a great area, a great continent with great natural resources. And uh, I have seen some recent surveys that can prove from United Nations actually, that can prove that the wealth that can be generated from the ocean uh, in Africa is um, now we can uh, value it um, in a conservative way. We can value it up to $24 trillion. That means that African countries can have an additional income from the ocean annually 2.5 trillion. So this is, this is something we cannot ignore. This is my first point. And we have to develop the blue economy in the right way, what I mean by saying the right way. So now we have, our, we have taken some lessons from the way we have treated the land and we have to be careful not to repeat the same mistakes referring to the ocean. So we have to do it in the right way. What I can say to you is that um, there are models worldwide, a lot of models that can prove that if we develop the blue economy sustainably, it will be a triple win situation. Triple win, what I mean by that, I mean that we can have a, a very good uh, out, uh, uh, outcomes for economic, environmental and uh, social benefits at the same time. So the development cannot be 
um, uh, with a cost at uh, ocean's health or society's health. We can do all of them at the same time, but we have to do it carefully. So we have to do it inclusively because this can um, uh, lead us to job creation, to food security and reinforcing the fight against hunger and poverty, capacity building for young people, gender equality and interests of local communities. But we have also have to respect the environment uh, to prevent loss of habitats and uh, cultures. And um, you know now everything is, uh, there are a lot of discussions about climate change and uh, the other threats against the oceans. What I would like to underline is that this is important here because uh, if uh, we are not taking measures against mm. these threats, this we, then we are going to undermine the resources on which the um, uh, blue economy depends. So there is, a not, there is not a conflict of interest, as we usually say, between environment and blue economy. There is not, not such a conflict of interest. Protecting the environment protects the basis on which the blue uh, economy is based. So to do all that in the best way means that uh, we have to, to make, in order to make a long story short, we have to take care of our waste. And uh, that's why the recycling and the good waste management uh, have to be at the heart of all this initiative. So Tara, let's move to the next slide, please. So referring to recycling and the waste management, I would like to say that we can start from the generation of waste. You can see here a map of Africa. And if you see the map, you can see that um, some of the countries are produce more waste, generate more of waste, for example, South Africa. Some of the countries are producing less. Nevertheless, all of the African countries are producing a lot. Uh, you can see at the next slide. Can you move to the next slide, please, Tara? So here is the global picture. And this is a very important picture for me because it can give you a basis to understand why Africa and Africa's waste problem is so important for the whole globe. Here is um, a study that can uh, uh, show you how we can, uh, uh, how we can see now the generation by region of waste management. And you can see that especially Sub-Saharan Africa is going to produce by end of this century, almost 3,500 tons of waste a day. Can you imagine that? You can see that European countries and uh, the countries of high income have uh, uh, are producing less and less waste through recycling through their priorities. But in Africa, we have a problem. The North Africa, you can see the blue line, Middle East and North Africa is producing a little less now, but Sub-Saharan Africa can be a great uh, problem. What I can say here, seeing this slide, and uh, I, I have some surveys that uh, are proving it, that um, if we are going like this, then whatever, whatever we are going to do in other areas, they are going to be overshadowed by the African problem. Let's see that in the next slide, please. So I would like to describe here with some uh, numbers, what is the situation in Africa right now? Of course, this is, here is the big picture. I'm very proud to be here with other people who are living in Africa and have a better sense of what is happening, but just to give you the general picture and then uh, we can discuss further. So uh, in Africa, the, recent, the, the most recent data I found uh, was about uh, 2012. So in that year, the solid waste in Africa uh, that was generated was 125 million tons. But what we can see is that this is going to double by 2050, 2025. And um, that's why I'm saying that whatever we are doing, we have to take care of the Africa's problem. Otherwise, the solid weight that is going to be dumped in the sea is going to spread all over the world. Um, waste collection services in most African countries are inadequate. 
Well, of course, I cannot say easily these words inadequate. I mean, they, I know that everybody is doing their best, but the average collection rate is only 55%, uh, which is very low. And uh, there is a problem. 90% of waste generated in Africa is disposed at uncontrolled dump sites and landfills. And uh, sometimes we have um, uh, open burning. I, I don't want to uh, elaborate on that, but you can understand how dangerous open burning is. 19 of the world's uh, 50 biggest dump sites are located in Africa, all in sub-Saharan Africa. So let's discuss a little bit about the composition. 13% of the solid waste generated in Africa is plastic. I'm very happy to see a lot of people are very, very, um, uh, how can I say, they know about plastic more than me, but plastic is 13% of the solid waste and 57% uh, is organic waste. Why am I mentioning organic waste especially? I mentioned organic waste because uh, organic waste is a special opportunity thanks to the uh, novelties in technology. So because of all this innovation, we can take a lot from organic waste. It can be uh, a, a socioeconomic opportunity for a lot of countries instead of being a problem. And then uh, the good news is that recycling has emerged across Africa. But what is very interesting to see is that this recycling uh, active, uh, action right now is not driven mainly by uh, the plans, the government's planning. It's driven mainly by poverty, unemployment, and socioeconomic needs. So people, they are desperate and they are going out and gather what is there. But um, uh, governments, have, uh, they have to do more about it. So 70 to 80% of the solid waste genera generated in Africa is recyclable, but only 4% of this is currently recycled. So um, what is happening is that the informal waste pickers, they are taking a lot of it. I mean, so this is the 4% uh, percent is the official number. The informal pickers are not um, connected with the formal data collection and whatever. So let's move to the next slide, please. So I, I, here is a slide I don't want to talk a lot, but uh, I would like just to write down what are the impacts of the mismanagement of this problem in Africa. Of course, you can understand that uh, there are a lot of uh, economic, social, and environmental impacts. Um, so doing nothing has a cost. This is what I would like to underline. Um, I tried to find surveys uh, that can estimate that cost. I couldn't find uh, anyone, but perhaps other speakers can uh, come into that. So for me, doing nothing cannot be an option anymore. Because um, what also we can expect is that Africa is set to undergo a major social and economic transformation over the next century, because we are going to have a population ex uh, explosion, urbanization of cities, changing of consumers' uh, choices. So all this is going to explode the generation of waste and the plastic waste if we are going with uh, no action. And um, it, it's obvious that if we're going like this, we're going to undermine the coastal and sea resources. We are going to uh, uh, increase the risk of disease, flooding and environmental pollution in cities. We are going to have uh, greenhouse uh, emissions uh, um, from the organics. We are going to have um, a, a lot of problems that we have to avoid. Let's move to the next slide, please. So here is my core slide. And here is what I, I can see as the future. I think that we have to see two phases. The phase one is bring waste under control. And the phase two is about harnessing the opportunities of waste as a resource to take the economic opportunities that waste can represent. So in the first, uh, in the first phase, uh, these phases are not separate, as you can understand. It's just for my slide here. You can do them uh, simultaneously. What I would like to say is that what I mean by first phase is to try uh, to, to produce 
to produce uh, less uh, waste, solid waste, to produce less and use it in a better way. In a better way. And we have uh, here services and technologies uh, in our uh, service, so we can use uh, appropriate inclusive waste services and technologies that can attract investment in this. We need money. I mean, this is not a detail. Money is always important, but here in Africa is much more important than elsewhere. And then we need uh, uh, some programs uh, to inform people about what is there. We need programs of capacity and awareness. So we need partnerships uh, for um, challenges, private partner, uh, private public partnerships, other type of partnerships. As uh, Tony said in the beginning, this is a huge problem. Nobody can uh, face it alone. No organization, no country. So this is what we really need. And then we need, of course, a science. We need the science that can give us evidence to work with uh, decision makers and persuade them to take action. So the decision makers can play a very important uh, role here through legislation and enforcement. We need good legislation and then we need mechanisms, mechanisms to be sure that this uh, legislation is implemented. Uh, the implementation is always the most difficult part of the exercise. I can say that from my previous experience as a European commissioner for marine, it's easy to put things on the paper. It's not so easy, but it can be done to go through the European Parliament and other institutions. And I'm sure that Soren is going to add on that. But then you have to implement. <laughs> and uh, this is the most important part. And you need cooperation, you need partnership, you need to persuade citizens. You cannot do that if the citizens, if the local partners are not there. Let's move to the next slide. So in the next slide, what I have done is I write down some ideas for strategies. Perhaps all these are already known to you, um, to bring waste under control um, and then to harness the opportunities of waste as a resource. Just to give you some example, can you go to the previous slide, please, Tara? Yes, here we are. So. Uh, if, if we want to bring waste under control, uh, uh, these are uh, well known, but just to, to give you a, a good ex a, some examples, what I mean by what we can do is we have to have clinic services in the cities, in the public area, not only high seas. We have to see how we can eliminate uncontrolled dumping and open burning of waste. Uh, we have uh, uh, to extend uh, uh, technologies for uh, waste uh, collection. We have uh, to control the everything. And what I would like to underline, just to give you an idea, is that uh, hazardous waste have to be treated properly. And this is very, very important because of the possible contamination. We are living throughout a pandemic here around the world, and you can under, everybody can understand now that some waste can be more dangerous than other. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, there are waste that are hard, waste which is harmful. Everything has to be treated, but some waste, some waste can be toxic, can be really very, very dangerous. So we need special technologies and control of that. And we have to separate this waste from the other. And then let me let me uh, say a little bit more about the opportunities of waste as a resource. Waste is really an opportunity. And um, we can use technologies and strategies. For example, in Africa, uh, everybody told me, perhaps you know everybody relevant told me, but perhaps you know better, there is this culture of reuse things because of uh, people um, cannot afford buying things all the time. So this um, culture of reusing things, of repairing things, um, uh, this uh, idea that we can take better advantage of the things we are producing, and perhaps to eliminate um, this very, very Western and very uh, dangerous idea of uh, one single use of things, it can be a solution to a lot of problems. 
we have to integrate existing small scale informal entrepreneurial activities. There are there, there are there, so at least this is my information, and connect them with the formal channels and the formal collection data so to have a better picture. We can um, incentivize the establishment of local and regional uh, markets. Uh, we can implement uh, alternative waste uh, treatment technologies. We can do a lot. We can do a lot. So you know better what we can do, and you know better what are the resources and what we have. But um, uh, what is important is to have that, uh, all that in mind to take the best decisions. So uh, my last slide, please, Tara. I hope uh, I, I said a lot, I'm sorry, I'm speaking a lot. I'm going to end up with this slide. So there, uh, here I have uh, gathered some innovation. So what I would like, the, the central message here, the central message of this slide is that there is innovation. There are new technologies that can be used. And I'm sure that some of the panelists are going to focus on that because they have the experience and the capacity to do so. Um, uh, what uh, we uh, need uh, mainly, and I'm going just to, to stand at my last point uh, for the sake of time, what we really need is to persuade government to have the there to establish the appropriate uh, framework uh, in order to attract investment. We have to attract investment in this area. The investment is not good enough at the moment. It's not adequate. So. We have to see who can bring money on board, private or public money. There are public resources uh, I have in mind in some Western countries, but there are not enough. There is private money, which is not enough. So through partnerships, perhaps we can match uh, this money that is coming in. Uh, but this means that the country have to have the favorable, favorable regulations and policies that have to be explored and implemented. And also, they have to have mechanisms to control implementation, reinforcement, and implementation afterwards. So this is for me. I'll stop here and see if there are any questions. Uh, hi, Maria. Um, that was wonderful. Um, I think there's plenty of agreements um, and some comments in the chat. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I know you have to head off soon, um, and so does our second speaker. Um, are you happy for us to email um, any questions to you that pop up later yes. during today's session? Uh, of course, of course, that will be fine. And also, if anybody is interested to find more about that, I can share my resources, whatever. So please send me whatever uh, you have for me. That will be fine. Thank you very much. From me um, to Maria, thanks very much indeed. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, we'll certainly forward on any um, any questions that come through to you um, over email. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Chris is the second speaker that we um, have here today. Um, Chris, would you like to um, present along? And then if anyone um, has any questions, please feel free to send those through and we'll read them out at the end of the session, um, just that they're preserved in the recording and we'll pass those on to Maria as well. And thank Chris, you, I, can, I can see your slides, they're up. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Uh, again, my apologies, I have to dash out uh, just now, but I will be back for questions um, at about 20 to two. Um, so if there's anything that can wait until then, I'm happy to, to answer. Um, I'm going to chat about the opportunities um, for, for recycling, plastics recycling in Africa, uh, and specifically looking at Africa in terms of the global context. We have a problem. So we know that this is uh, it's not just a third world issue. Um, you know, we have pictures here of, of what is typically seen in South Africa. Um, but in any of the developing countries, um, if you look at Manila, I think this is a picture of the Citroen River. We have massive problems in terms of looking at the um, management of our waste streams. And we're not alone. In the first world, it uh, doesn't matter where you are. Uh, in the remotest islands in Hawaii, uh, whether you're looking at California, where we think everything is hunky-dory, uh, or Norway, which we perceive to be green, uh, the, the issue around wastes, and particularly ocean plastics, is massively problematic. But our focus today is on one waste stream, and we're going to look at uh, tackling recycling plastic waste. 
So what we can do is we can say, uh, no, um, there's a, an opportunity to just try and ban everything and say no more plastics. Uh, it's not realistic. It's not going to happen. We need to understand that uh, in terms of plastics production, uh, this is set to increase by some 40% in the next decade. The reality is, is that the petrochemical industries um, where our plastics come from are uh, in a bit of a bind at the moment as el electric vehicles and energy efficiency is the, the, uh, the, the talk of, of the town at the moment. So at the moment, we're looking at about 6% of our, plast of our, of our uh, crude that goes to plastic production, um, and that is set to increase to about 14%. So we have to understand plastics are here to stay. <clears throat> we need to find solutions, and we've got to look at opportunities. So we can look at some level of management. Um, we can ban some plastics. We can design better. Um, the other, if you look at the, the graphic to the right, over the last 10 years, um, our cool drink bottles have gone from um, about 24 grams to about 10 grams. But the simple reality is this benefits the packaging industry. It's still plastic waste. It's still going to end up in the ocean and it's still going to kill our turtles. So while we need to look at the opportunity in terms of um, what's happening, uh, is that internationally we've got certain companies jumping on the bandwagon. We have the likes of Nike with the ocean shoes. Uh, we have the recycled ocean plastic sunglasses. And the simple reality is, is that in terms of those people uh, on this call, probably very few of us could um, afford such luxury items. But they are tackling a tiny portion of the element, but they do provide the, the uh, exposure and knowledge to the issues. We do have an idea where this is coming from. And uh, the previous speaker alluded to this as well. Um, we know that, that the developing worlds are the, the prime focus uh, for, for plastic leakage into the sea. And this comes from our esteemed colleague, uh, Prof. Jambeck. But um, we know where it's coming from, but the solutions need to be realistic. In Africa, we don't need shoes and sunglasses. We need education, we need health, we need infrastructure, food, energy, jobs, and these are the important things we need to look at. And the way forward for Africa really is that we need to put away the begging bowl. We've got to stop looking to the first world uh, to bail us out of this problem. Uh, and we need to understand that effectively what works in the first world is not always working in developing uh, economies. Uh, part of the reasons why we've uh, established this organization in Europe is to try and, and look at the, um, the, the development of opportunities in terms of developing circular economy in Africa, mm -hmm. where we try and avoid Eurocentric ideas that may not fit in with uh, the, the situation that we have here. And that is simply the fact that we have very substantially different socioeconomic dynamics. We don't have the structures, resources, and systems of the first world. And a lot of the technologies we're looking at um, are paid for through gate fees and high landfill fees, which we cannot um, substantiate in, in, in Africa. What we do have is we have the need, the desire, the skills, and the innovative ability to drive solutions for what is gonna work for Africa. And we need to unlock the value chains to create products that we need in Africa to cater for our rapidly expanding population. And we need to drive green procurement and local production. The simple reality is we actually have the solutions for all plastic wastes right here. We don't really need foreign investment in international technologies. What we need, and the previous speaker uh, alluded to this very clearly, is we need the legislative and regulatory frameworks that stop hindering local innovation. We need the financing applications and opportunities to be able to bring these to the fore. And we need the opportunity to be able to put these projects on the ground and, and scale them. We need producers to take real responsibility. We're currently going through extended producer responsibility development in, in South Africa. And um, it certainly is in a better place uh, under a section 18 than it was before in a section 28, where we have an industry involvement. So we're certainly looking forward to some forward thinking with regards to, to developing solutions. But our issue is that we need to create markets for products through supply chain management and material specification. It's not rocket science. We need to be able to look at this in terms of saying the solutions are here, the opportunities are here, where are the blockages and how do we make these opportunities happen? And we need to change our mindset. There's a, a general perception um, uh, in, in terms of recycling uh, that it, it's extremely naive at the moment. Very few people fully understand the entire value chain in terms of recycling. And we tend to think that recycling is irrelevant. I always like to use that slide. 
But we need to change our thinking and understand the impacts and the outcomes of waste as a resource. So changing that narrative includes looking at delivery in terms of social upliftment, skills development, economic development, energy opportunities, water and wastewater, infrastructure and housing, manufacturing, climate change, food security, et cetera. And these are different sectors that benefit from the transition uh, of developing a waste economy, which is gonna allow us to achieve our sustainable development goals. And there's a number of different things that we're looking at here. We have solutions that uh, waste can be uh, uh, available in terms of education. Um, at the moment, we're busy developing at the, at the top end of the scale, um, international systems in collaboration with uh, Africa Learning University and other international organizations like Ellen MacArthur Foundation to develop education systems for um, sort of postgraduate uh, applications in circular economy. But the reality is that our problem starts with early childhood development. And 80% of a child's brain potential is developed by the age of four. There's a great little company here called Singaquenza that looks at um, providing support to organizations looking at recycled materials that provide skills in terms of numeracy and literacy. And we need to change what we're looking at in terms of education. But we also have opportunities in terms of food security. Um, the big issue in Africa is that we tend to have a massive problem with urbanization and we leave the land and we move to the cities and then people starve. We have solutions in recycling. There are systems like the Omgibi Farming Organics uh, system, uh, which a lot of people uh, know about in, in South Africa. And again, using recycled materials to look at intensive agriculture, uh, not as complicated as hydroponics, but the opportunity in terms of looking at reduced resources for increased production. And there again, we can look at nutrient recycling, vermiculture and, and compost. We can also look at different applications in terms of, uh, of, of manufacturing. We can look at waste packaging materials for construction. Um, in terms of roof tiles, there's a new system that's uh, about to be launched in, uh, in July using a big brand name in South Africa where they have a 100% recycled roof tile um, that is 100% recyclable using waste plastics and, uh, and, and, and um, recycled uh, aggregates. But we can also use things like tires into tiles and other applications. Glass can go into wall and insulation and, and, and water filtration. Uh, we're working on projects at the moment with the World Resources Forum, uh, developing um, problematic waste streams such as e-waste into um, uh, high value products. So all of these divert waste from landfill and they can create jobs and offset imports. We can use uh, waste packaging for construction materials. Uh, and these are all South African applications. If one looks at furniture, social infrastructure, uh, fence poles, plastic pavers, fencing, boardwalks and blocks, these can all be manufactured locally. And again, the issue is more about the supply and the demand and looking at material specification. We can also use waste packaging for road infrastructure. Um, I think a lot of people might have heard about the first plastic road in South Africa, which is the Magriba Road um, that was built in Jeffreys Bay. Uh, the reality is that certainly was not the first plastic road in South Africa. Uh, the Magriba Road was a Scottish technology that used imported materials um, using highly recyclable polyolefins um, at a six to eight uh, percent range in, in, in a road surface. And yet we have our own technologies locally where we have 12 to 16% um, in terms of a, a, a dry melt system for, for plastic road production. And KZN has built the first um, plastic roads in South Africa through Shisalanga and others. The technology is developed now that we're looking at up to 45% um, mixed plastic wastes that can go into, into road systems using a hot melt system. And again, the issues around the, the um, getting it through compliance and legislation and specifications. And, and simply these are stronger, cheaper and better than conventional materials. Um, and they would, would absorb a huge amount of, of waste in the sector. So we can look at the opportunities through sustainable technologies. Um, and there are a lot of problematic dirty plastics and we can convert these into, into different products. So we've seen the application in terms of um, the, the developing world with the, the issues we have um, in a rural and urban environment uh, in terms of the plastic waste. But there are a number of different scale applications that we've developed um, in, in South Africa. There are small scale pyrolysis uh, and refinery systems that have been developed and proven. Um, we've developed a small 
scale waste energy systems are in scrubbing units at, at a fraction of the cost of imported materials uh, that achieve 98% efficiency. And the opportunity in terms of looking at um, modularized systems of um, uh, converting problematic waste streams into energy. Uh, and looking around about um, three to five tons of um, high CV waste streams per megawatt of energy. But we can also look at combining that into uh, infrastructure products. So some of the stuff that, uh, that has been done locally is to develop the likes of pavers, uh, retainers, uh, drainage U-channels, curbstones. And if you want to put that into perspective, um, and again, the, these are, are manufactured from 50% um, mixed unrecyclable plastic wastes and 50% uh, crushed glass or recycled grit. If you look at um, each metro, um, each of the eight big metros uses about a million paving stones a year. And a million, million paving, paving stones a year across the eight metros is about 100,000 tons. That's just in paving stones. 100,000 tons of plastics that could be repurposed. There's also a similar volume of retainers that are used, um, bricks and blocks and drainage channels. So again, massive opportunities for, uh, for, for um, creating economic development and creating value in the waste. And there's also uh, options that are available in terms of looking at the real problematic um, stream right at the end. So the residual waste, one can look at reducing that volume. Um, and there's everyone is really anti incineration in this country. But the simple reality is that there are small scale systems. Um, this unit here, the smallest unit processes two tons per day, it runs on solar power, and it converts the, the product into 4% ash. And that ash is inert and can be used either in agricultural applications or in building construction uh, opportunities. Part of what we're looking at uh, at the moment with uh, our partners in the UK and Malaysia is we're redesigning the system to trap the waste heat out of this. So effectively, um, a system that was designed just to get rid of the waste, um, we're now converting that into a miniature power plant. And we have the engineering design now for systems between 180 and 200 kilowatts, uh, looking at harvesting the, the waste from the truly problematic um, uh, residual waste systems. So energy is key in Africa. Um, we need to look at, at recovering the energy on plastics that we can't recycle. Energy um, is, is a huge problem in Africa and Africa is renowned in terms of being energy poor. In South Africa, to put it into perspective, we have a, a grid capacity of about 40,000 megawatts with a population of just under 60 million. In Nigeria, the transmission grid is about 10% of that, 4,000 megawatts with a population three times our size. So most of Africa runs on liquid fuels or, or, or energy. Uh, and we don't have the infrastructural capacity and resources to build massive transmission grids. We need to look at opportunities in terms of microgrids. South Africa has 68% of Africa's energy, energy generation total of 58,000 um, megawatts. And again, put that in perspective, we have only 3% of China's generation capacity. Africa has only 4% of China's generation capacity. New York is half of America's capacity, uh, half of Africa's capacity. And that's one city in the USA. South Korea has three times the generation capacity of South Africa and is 12% the size of our country with a population with 10 million people less than we have. So we've got to put that into perspective. Energy is the vital uh, component in terms of, of going forward. I argue with my uh, purists and my academics in circular economy spaces, they're saying, well, it's not really circular economy and, and absolutely no, it's not. Um, and, and we will transition to that and there are opportunities. It is far more expensive converting plastics back into plastics. Um, there are a lot of complications in terms of contaminated waste streams going back into plastics and the costs are significant. So in the meantime, let's get going in terms of uh, developing real issues or, or um, identifying real opportunities from real issues to create opportunities for Africa. Because energy is key. Energy is the basis of all secondary development in Africa. We can't develop secondary recycling or processing, materials beneficiation, manufacturing, food processing or agri-processing, water management, wastewater management, communications, education, industry and social infrastructure without energy. So there's a key opportunity here. And again, the technologies are here, the technologies are available. Um, legislation is, is a massive hurdle uh, at the moment uh, in terms of, of the simple fact that uh, if you look at locally, 
our legislation is 40 year old uh, legislation that's based on on trying to protect us against systems such as Petro SA and, and Sasol at a massive scale whereas uh, some of these systems um, are small enough to to fit into uh, a 20 foot container uh, we, we can't look at it under the same route so we need to be mindful of how we move forward from there so we need to get this before it gets into the sea if we look at all these different systems and we create opportunities and again understanding the likes of the epr where we could look at directing that to the informal sector um, in south africa it's well known 90 percent of the waste that enters into our recycling system is collected by the informal sector and we can collect that uh, before it gets into the sea by making sure there's a value for that if there's a value for it i can guarantee you it will not end up in the environment uh, if one person throws it in, somebody else will pick it up because it has a value. We need jobs, we need the opportunities in terms of developing the informal sector. So sustainable solutions and smart opportunities for plastic are not only possible, they're actually economically viable. So we need to wake up, we need to look at the opportunities, we need to grasp them. We need to look at talks like this where we create the connections with our international partners to drive the development, the research, um, and we need to work with local governments in terms of legislation and um, uh, creating the markets. Um, so there's a lot of scope, there's a lot of hope, and I'm hoping we can uh, unpack some of that in the questions a little bit later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Chris. Um, it was wonderful to, to hear your presentation. Um, I understand you have to step off now um, for a TV interview, but we look forward to having you back with us again soon um, to discuss some of the questions. Um, thank you very much. I'll be back thank you so much. Uh, Soren, um, over to you. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for giving me the floor and inviting me uh, here today. Now, the problem of waste in our oceans is huge and unfortunately it does not seem to stop anytime soon and I've been very in, inspired by hearing Maria and Chris's uh, intervention um, gave me a lot of food for thought. There's no doubt that it's important that we come together and share best practices while raising awareness of this uh, important issue and therefore, as I've said before, I was very happy to be invited to this event today. As we have already heard, the panel today is impressive and I'm looking forward to learning from you all and engaging in the discussion. I'll try and touch on what we in the European Parliament do to prevent plastic waste in our oceans and what I think we should do more of. I'm not only here representing the European Parliament, but also the organization Waste Free Oceans. I'm extremely proud to be associated with this organization as I believe they are doing an incredible job in protecting our oceans. Let me briefly outline what waste-free oceans actually does. And it is in fact rather simple. Waste-free oceans clear, clears up our oceans, recycle plastics and educate our kids. Of course, the task is not simple and for sure it's not fulfilled, but somebody has to start one place. Waste Free Oceans is presented across the globe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, Europe, and US. They collect plastic using different technologies and create an actual value from the waste by upcycling into products that consumers are seeking. And I fully agree with Chris have said, I mean, this is not, this is not a one size fits all solution. There are bigger problems in, in, in Africa than we have in maybe in, in Europe. Um, waste free oceans know that it's not enough to simply clean. We need to stop the damage. We need to prevent plastic from ending up in our oceans in the first place. And therefore they are tirelessly working to educate the next generation. This is done by teaching them the value of our oceans, how fragile they are. And this is done very hands-on by taking kids to beach cleaning um, in different places in the world. In my view, this is very good, if not brilliant, because um, I also want to touch briefly on what the EU has tried to do to prevent plastics from ending in the ocean. First of all, we adapted the single-use plastic directive. It simply aims, aims at phasing out the plastics 
most commonly found on our beaches. I agree with Chris have said, plastic is here to stay, but we have to deal with those plastics we really do not want end up in our oceans. Secondly, the circular econom economy plane aims at promoting recycling. This is against about giving waste a value, not only to prevent it from ending up in the oceans, but also because producing things just to throw them away is essentially a waste of resources. Also in the fishery, fisheries uh, community, where I am the vice chair, we have adopted uh, recommendations to the commission on a strategy to eliminate marine, uh, maritime waste. Of course, this is not enough, but it is a start. I believe that we also have to recognize the res responsibility that comes with being one of the richest regions on earth. Not all countries have the opportunity to set aside money to prevent waste from entering their oceans. We need to help them with this and we need to recognize that we cannot just skip our waste to less fortunate countries unless we are sure that it will be disposed in a responsible manner. I believe that we have to give waste a value. No one will throw out plastic into the sea if it has a value and we can give it a value. We can create many good products from the plastic waste, high products that consumers want and I must say that the crisis interventions was so inspiring to see what could actually happen if we uh, transfer the technology and maybe pay some money for those countries who are not as fortunate as we are. And But we have to do that to make sure there is a market for the plastics we don't want to see end up in the oceans because at the end of the day, oceans belongs to us, everybody. And even though it's it ends up in the oceans in Africa, it might end up in another place in the world. We can also create fuels, we can create energy, as Chris just stated, this is a really need in, in Africa. It's better to, to use uh, plastics in, um, in certified uh, power plants than just to be mess them uh, with a, a lighter. There's absolutely no need for a resource to be thrown into the ocean where it damages the ecosystem when we know that it actually could have a value. Also, we need to recognize the impact our fishers have. Also in my country, it's no more than a generation ago uh, when fishers simply threw their waste uh, overboard. And I know this is still happening many places on earth, maybe not in my part of the world, but I think it's, it's done many places. And for this, I believe education is a key. The fishers are running their own fishing grounds and the next generations. But we also need to recognize why they do so. Sometimes it is because there are no proper facilities in the port to get rid of the waste. This is also something richer countries should support poorer countries in development. Lastly, I want to highlight that the problem of waste in our oceans is huge. There's no doubt about it. We have seen it on the pictures both shown by Maria and uh, Chris. But still, it is a problem that can be solved if you really want to solve it. When we come together as citizens, NGOs, industries and politicians, we actually have a chance of solving this problem. We must work hard to put this waste problem higher up on the international agenda. We owe it to our oceans and our children. I would like to thank you uh, all for dedicating so many hours of your time to discuss and maybe try to come to some solutions with this uh, problem. I am looking forward to the discussion and I just want to uh, finish thing by saying thank you very much for inviting me. I am really inspired and I'm sure we will have a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Soren. Um, it's, it's great to hear the perspective um, from Europe. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to send those through in the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll address those um, after the final presentation this morning. Uh, Anna B, are you, there you are. Uh, are you um, <laughs> ready and happy to share your screen? I'm, I'm ready and um, happy to share my screen. 
Is it visible? Yes, yes, it's up and we can see it. Okay, okay perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm asked to specifically to talk about um, plastics recycling. Um, and yes, we've, we've heard our previous speakers all touching on it in, in various uh, aspects. And I think for me, uh, a starting point is, is if one look at the global and um, a couple of, of weeks now, I'm doing some um, virtual training and I asked the trainees um, to find me messages on, on plastics recycling on the social media. And the bulk of that is from a so-called global perspective, which in, in plastics recycling really means Europe. Um, so when we read on the internet, when we read other people's articles and, and comments, um, it's often coming out of a, a direct Europe perspective. We're sitting in our amazing Africa and, and we have totally different challenges. And I think um, Chris specifically um, alluded to a lot of those. When I'm talking, it, it's really from a South African perspective because um, that's the industry I know and that, that's the recycling I know. So we've seen these pictures, um, all our previous speakers have spoken about it and it, it's real, it's genuine, it's every day in our environment. We open um, social media, we open uh, the written media and, and we just get bombarded with all these negative things about um, plastics and, and everything around us. So I think before we do anything, we need to say, how do we differ um, from a basic waste management point. Um, and, and again, if I look the, use the global um, perspective, um, I was fortunate enough to visit um, Italy um, just prior to COVID, when was that, 2019? Um, and, and, and I'm using them as, as representing uh, the EU. Um, separation at source is, is absolutely key. Every house um, household have, in some cases up to nine bins um, that they put out on a regular basis. Um, for them, it's the right thing to do. Um, they just don't even consider this, this another way of dealing with their domestic waste. Um, most of those systems is funded by local government um, through a household tax or a, a huge subsidy from the, the government. It's very well monitored. They know exactly what every bin um, from every household is, is collecting. And generally speaking, just incredibly organized. If we take um, a South African um, scenario, and I'm taking myself as, as a middle to high income person, um, this in very, very little separation at source taking place. Um, CSIR tells us it's at between five to seven percent on, on a national basis. Um, waste management is, is a function of the local government. I live in Johannesburg, so the city of Johannesburg um, come and fetch my waste on, on a weekly basis. Despite that, we still have very high levels of illegal dumping. Right in our upmarket suburbs, we, we see it on a daily basis. And then um, the, the local government service is sometimes they come and sometimes they don't. So we also have to live with that. What do you do with, with bins and bags um, on the pavement if, if they're not collected? But then there's also a vast part of our population um, and, and official statistics tells us 29% of all our households don't have any form of waste removal service. They don't have a city of Joburg collecting their waste. 3%, um, um, that's outside or on top of that 29%, uh, using communal refuse dumps. And, and we hear Maria saying, you know, open burning or, or just totally unmanaged, unengineering um, refuse dumps. 2% have some form of service, maybe it's a skip. Um, in the area where they can take stuff. So in total, what we're really saying is only 67% of our population has access to waste management. So slightly better than, than the 55% that, that um, Maria earlier mentioned. So in, in basic waste management, we, we differ. Um, and one of the comments in the chat said, we need to start with, with education. 
Now, if I'm a kid living in, in this um, top right hand side picture suburb um, and you teaching me at school um, that I mustn't litter, um, but I have no bin. Um, I can't put my rubbish um, in, in a formal bin that gets removed. Um, what do I do? So, yeah, I think we need to say if we look at recycling in, in an African context, um, it is totally, totally different to what we see um, in first world countries. And, and the previous speakers have spoken about that as well. So looking um, very specifically at um, plastics recycling and the recycling value chain, um, and, and we've used this picture um, a number of times. Sorry, I just want to get this thing out the way. Um, a number of times. So um, I want you to base uh, my, my short talk on this value chain. And I think nothing is going to work if there isn't a market. Um, and again, this is this is totally different to how Europe looks at, at plastics recycling. So um, in a South African context, um, the market is the pull action. We, we demand driven. Um, we have a brand owner that says I need a, a white uh, odor free high density polyethylene for my deodorant bottle. Um, then the recycler is responding to that and it, it creates a pull action right up the value chain. We need to ask ourselves, what is the recycler going to be used for? Um, so this is now also saying if we need to establish recycling in an environment um, where there's none, like in many of our African countries. Is it going to be for a virgin replacement? Um, and we know that, that only uh, RPET or recycled PET currently can be used directly in contact with food, but there's many non-food contact applications um, also as a virgin replacement. And then we also privileged in South Africa that we've developed a lot of markets specifically um, for recycled material where they don't actually compete with virgin. They have their own unique applications and, and markets. And one also need to say, is this market going to be um, domestic only in my country or in my region? Uh, like a static environment, or is it going to be um, a product that I'm going to tell, try and sell on, on the international market? So uh, before we even start thinking about recycling, what am I going to sell it into? Where's my market? Um, if one just uh, look at South Africa's um, recycled market, um, we recycle a lot of flexible packaging and therefore also the flexible packaging portion here is, is our biggest single market. But it goes in a variety of products for the agricultural industry, building and construction, clothing, um, packaging, rigid and, and flexible um, isn't all of it. Um, there's, there's many other markets. So the second part of, of the chain I want to look at is the actual recycling. Um, where does it happen? What, what is the process? And remember, when, when I talk recycling, it's turning it back into a raw material. It's, it's not just um, making, making uh, Chris's um, elephants out of milk bottles or, or weaving um, mats from, from carrier bags. Um, so from, from my context, it's, it's taking it back into raw material. You need to make sure that, that your processors or your recyclers are actually economic units. Um, where recycling gets subsidized to a big extent, um, they're not sustainable. Um, in, in South Africa, the, most of our um, processing units for recycling is, is owner driven, um, single, single owners or husband, wives or father, sons um, combinations. Is our plants um, fit for purpose? Um, if you're going to recycle PET for food contact, um, you really need very sophisticated and capital intensive plants. Um, but there's many other applications. And also we know that a PET plant is not the same as a polypropylene plant, is not the same as a polystyrene plant. 
and, and often smaller modular plants that can grow capacity. We have many recyclers in South Africa that started with one tiny little Chinese machine um, and now they have like 12 tiny Chinese machines. But we have other recyclers with massive big Italian Technovas or, or Stalinger machines, Austrian machines. Um, one size is, is not going to solve it. So you, you really need to look at what is fit for purpose in, in your area. Um, if one just look at, at um, a typical South Africa scenario, we have about 300 plants. Uh, we have recyclers that has uh, small little economic units for less than 50 tons a month. Um, and, and there's companies that's doing more than 2000 tons a month. Um, these companies having state of the art, we mentioned the, the Stalinger Austrian or IRIMA. Um, and there's also many recyclers that have small Chinese and, and Indian equipment. So then um, the middle part, and, and this is really, I think the crux of, of the whole recycling value chain is, is the actual collection part of it. And, and um, the block now on my screen is, is the formal collection part where it, it's all determined by um, what are we recycling? Is there enough material of this specific? Is there enough polypropylene copolymer for the collectors actually to have a dedicated stream for that, um, to have an ongoing supply that they invest in, in sorting and, and separating? Um, can it be easily identified or is it often mixed with other materials or do we borrow molds across the, the different material streams? Does it make economic sense? Uh, because I think in, a, in a South Africa and probably in the rest of Africa, um, it's all about money. It's not the right thing to do. It's not um, be, because we're so green. Um, you hear Chris is saying it, it's really providing jobs and income and, and energy. Um, so does it make economic sense? If we only have 10 tons of this specific product in, in, in a country or in a region, um, our formal collection industry is not going to try and get hold of that 10 tons. They're rather going to go and focus on, on the high volume materials because that impacts on the transport um, and everything else. So if, if one look at in, in a South African context again, what are we recycling? And, and our last available figures is, is for 2019. Our single biggest material that we recycle is, is um, soft plastics or uh, polyethylene films, uh, like bread bags and shrink wrap and pallet wrap and um, frozen veggie bags, rice bags, um, the cover that's around your new mattress. Second um, biggest material is our Coke and, and water bottles or cool drink and, and water bottles, obviously not only Coke, um, which is very popular. High density polyethylene is, is growing um, where it's a predominantly um, rigid packaging, uh, but there's also um, waste bins that's in there. We also recycle a bit of, of pipe um, and chemical containers. Polypropylene is quite broad from flexible packaging, uh, rigid packaging to, to household domestic goods, outdoor furniture, um, and, and things that gets recycled on a regular basis. PVC is more on the non-packaging side, um, cables and footwear um, that gets recycled, and then polystyrene um, also is a split between packaging and, and non-packaging. And they look um, tiny in the big, uh, tonnages, but also bearing in mind um, polystyrene is a, is a much smaller material. So um, the percentages here is not the recycling rates, it's out of the total materials we recycled, how much of those was polyethylene or polystyrene. So back to my um, recycling chain. Um, in, in a third world or an African context, um, the waste picking part um, is playing an important role. Um, in, in South Africa, it's, a, it's an informal sector. In other words, it's people um, that's doing it because there's, there's value in it. Um, and for them, it's, it's a source of income. Um, and it's 100% based on reward for effort. 
they're not street cleaners. Um, they're not walking around and, and picking up stuff that is littered. They're picking up stuff that will, for the least amount of effort of bending down and, and picking it up, will give them the quickest um, way of, of earning a living for that day. We've seen it um, where prices increased. Um, we see that less materials get collected because in a shorter period, I make enough money for, for that day to sustain my, my income and, and my family as needs. Where we need to be 100% um, sure, and uh, Maria also made a comment around this earlier on, is, is where we knew, where we pay, it's easier word for me, where we pay the waste picker for what he collected. We need to make sure it's market related. Um, we can't give him a charity amount of money to say, listen, I'm so grateful that you brought me 12 milk bottles. And instead of paying him for the actual weight of the plastic, um, we pay him a, a massive subsidized amount. Because um, at the moment that money is, is no longer there, it, it, it's not going to be sustainable. And, and this complete recycling value chain um, the, the value in it um, for each individual group have to be related to, to the rest of the chain. The, the problem with waste pickers is, is what about the, the less popular material and, and what about material that's not in a dedicated bin in, in higher volumes? Um, and it, it's 100% based on price. Currently, um, K4 carton in, in South Africa um, is in high demand, and we find the waste pickers would pick that up much rather than um, polypropylene products, for example. As the market is changing, um, the material of preference change because it's based on, on the reward for effort. Um, uh, South Africa, we, we estimate that the waste pickers currently is, is about 59,000 people. Um, that's actually collecting that waste. They don't only collect it um, from curbsides. Um, the bulk of that 59,000 people is actually working off landfills because the volume um, is there and, and it's all in one place. So if, if one look at what we recycled in 2019, 70% um, was coming directly from, from landfills and, and rubbish bins. Um, from the post-industrial area, it was about 13%, um, of which a, a big portion of that is, is around the, the transportation of, of packaging, so pallet wrap and, and shrink wrap. And then um, out of factories, it is about a 13%. Um, the challenge with post-consumer harvesting materials from landfill is that they very, very contaminated. Um, this picture is taken at a recycler, uh, material that he bought from um, a waste management company. They received it from waste pickers um, that was working on landfill. So my last part of, of the recycling value chain is, is really what does my incoming waste stream look like? And, and Soren was, was touching on, on this as well. Um, you know, what, what do we generate? Um, how do we actually um, get so much materials and so much waste? Um, and, and the picture is a nice managed waste stream from someone living in a middle and high income household with a bin on the pavement. But we also need to bear in mind there is mismanaged waste, this, this litter, this illegal dumping. Um, so if we want to recycle those materials, for example, from those litter booms that, that Chris had in some of his pictures. How do we get it out of the system? Separation at source is, is a great idea. It will give us cleaner material. It will give um, the recycler opportunity to, to have less rubbish. Um, so the whole money spent on what they do is, is better. Um, but will it work for an area, um, those 29% of people that don't even have waste management? How do we involve the citizen? What is the citizen supposed to do? Must he remove a label? Must he rinse the product? Uh, must he flatten it? Um, so, so we need to com be communicating to, to our uh, citizens as well. 
designed for recycling. Um, it's it's relatively low on my list, although critical. Um, is it a blue cap on a white bottle? Is it a, a label on, on a bottle? And, and yeah, we need to involve our brand owners in that. Um, but there's other aspects in this recycling value chain that is evenly important. And, and education and creating awareness, we, we touched on already. So how do we solve the plastics in the environment problem? And, and often people say, easy. Just recycle more. And, and really, my topic is also uh, the portion of, of the solution that um, recycling is playing. Will that alone um, recycling, will it actually reduce plastics in the environment? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so, because um, we need some other solutions as well. Um, if, we, if we, again, uh, focus on South Africa, we recycled um, 352,000 tons of, of plastic back into raw material in, in 2019, um, which was locally collected material, locally converted. 45% um, of all recyclable waste was, was collected um, for recycling in 2019. But, and it's the massive big but, there's still about a million tons in, in South Africa that's not getting recycled. Um, so will all the effort and money going into recycling actually solve our litter problem? Um, and we're saying, no, we need to do something else as well. And, and a lot of Chris's examples around um, the energy, the incineration um, was based on, on these alternatives. So recycling being mechanical, taking waste and turn it into raw material, that's one solution. Um, but we need to find others. Um, and he mentioned a couple, and, and I'm really just summarizing them together and saying um, there's the plastic cement mixtures, um, there's the pyrolysis, and then there's also the, the compression molding, the desks and the, the decking and, and school desks. Um, and for the people that's going to look at the presentation, I've, I've listed some websites um, of South African companies doing alternative recycling. So what did I say? And, and this is really summarizing just at, at the end. We have a waste problem. I don't think anyone argues that. Recycling seems to be a good solution um, and, and it will help and it, it will definitely um, address the, the circular economy need. If we look at what Europe is doing, and then I specifically say China um, or the global, so Europe, um, America and, and China, um, these solutions is, is not necessarily going to work for us. Um, Africa is, is different to the rest of the world. South Africa is different to, to Africa. And, and we really need to find each of our own purpose, fit for purpose solution in, in my little town, in my suburb, in my district, in my country, um, because it, it's not going to just take someone else's solution and come and plug it in here. Um, and we heard other speakers saying the same thing. And um, recycling alone is, is not going to help us. Um, we need a combination. And I don't know how many of you have looked at the um, breaking the plastics wave report, which is really saying every little aspect is, is going to help us um, to a certain extent. South Africa is now uh, actively participating in, in um, a study as well to look at our local data and how is it going to change um, the waste plastic leaking into the sea. And um, that's from our side. And um, I'm looking forward to our panel discussion. And I hope you're all ready for lots of questions and lots of comments. Thank you so much, Annabi. Uh, we will be having um, another panelist rejoining us shortly. Um, but in the meantime, there's a question that was posed in the Q&A box that says, recycling is always the best option, but some plastic will always escape and end up in rivers and oceans. What is the view of OXO biodegradable plastics that will deal with this without causing microplastics? Um, Soren, Annabi, I don't know if you want to comment on this. Uh, a comment has already been made that the EU has banned OXO plastics as, as it's considered a, ma a major problematic product and not a solution. Um, would you like to add anything to this? 
Yeah, I, I could just say that, that we have had tough discussions in the parliament on this issue. And as Maria rightly said, you know, um, having a discussion in the parliament and turning it out to something that can be used in the real world, there is um, a way to go. Having said that, of course, I, th I think there is awareness of, of plastics. We have the discussion in, in Europe right now, uh, in my country, you pay uh, a lot of money uh, when you buy a, a bottle and you get uh, a refund when, when you give it in again. And I think in, in, uh, you can't do that all over the world, but you, you can put uh, money into plastics and you can make sure that people know that uh, they have to, to give it back. Otherwise, they have lost uh, a lot of money. And, and we, we can't agree on doing uh, one system in Europe right now. But of course, if we want to be some of, uh, some of those to, to look into you know, taking the right decision, of course, we, we, we need to do more. Uh, but as I said in my intervention, we also have to take some responsibility on our shoulders. I mean, when we see those uh, pictures with all the plastics in the rivers and on the beaches, it, I think it's heartbreaking because it all comes into microplastic. I mean, that is what you can see, but when it's out in, in the ocean for years and decades, you have all this microplastic that will end up in, uh, in all the species living in the sea. And, and uh, some uh, scientists, they have, uh, they have shown, you know, that um, many species around the world, they, they bear, you know, micros, uh, microplastic in, in, their, um, uh, in their bodies. And, and, and to be honest, it, it, can, it can ruin, I mean, not only the possibilities for the fishermen, but it can also ruin the ecosystem. Uh, and and we, have to, we have to put this uh, higher up on the agenda. And we have also been one of the richest regions in the world. We have to allocate some money for this and, and giving away some... Um, eight to different uh, parts of the world. I mean, this could be included in it. I mean, it's not only about uh, climate or uh, it is also about uh, plastics and, and how to recycle it. So, so I think uh, both the European Union, but also the member states, individual member states, they have to step up to the plate and, uh, and recognize that this is something we cannot just close our eyes for this in the decade to come. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, you also asked specifically around OXO. Um, the, the challenge with OXO in South Africa is that there is just not enough evidence that where it's going to be used in, in durable applications and, and a lot of um, recycled materials in South Africa ends up in, in um, builders' film, uh, damp cores, pipes, um, decking and furniture. Um, there's absolutely not enough evidence to show that, that biodegradables will not harm that stream um, or OXO biodegradables very specifically. And, and as a plastics recycling industry, we, we're not supporting um, OXO at all in South Africa, despite the fact that we know certain materials will be leaking. Um, we're saying the effort should rather go into cut down on those leakages and, and have better waste management in place. Sorry. Thank you, Anna B um, and Soren. Those, those are great comments. Um, there is another question uh, that's directed uh, for Chris. So I think we'll hang on to that um, until he returns. Uh, then just there have been a few comments uh, that have come through in the chat that says, um, just got back from Senegal, and I can only agree with Ms. Uh, Damanaki that we are nowhere in sub-Saharan Africa on waste management. Um, and it seems to be an issue not of necessarily of infrastructure, but education um, and culture. Um, and organic waste um, is typically not recycled there. Um, or fed to livestock. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment on organic waste um, or if we will stick to plastics for today, uh, unless anyone would like to comment. Um, then there's another general, a few general comments that say um, South Africa needs, I'm assuming that that that's the essay that's referred to, um, needs better awareness uh, of reducing, reusing um, what can be recycled and how, um, as well as um, a what's in it for me incentive, like creating work and paying people to recycle, um, as well as uh, better information of local waste disposal or recycling centers. Um, would anyone like to comment on these so far? I'll, I'll do a quick comment um, before I uh, give over to Soren on, um, I recycle because it generates an income for someone. And, and I think that is, that is one of the things we need to stay very clear of. 
Um, we find the same with littering. Um, There's a belief in South Africa that if you litter, um, it, it cre creates a job for someone. And I really think we need to get out of that and, and saying, how do we add value to our waste? Um, which is a misnomer to start off with because we shouldn't have the waste to start off in the first place. But we always have waste. And, and um, the, the whole thing around recycling should be um, to make it easier for the rest of the value chain, including um, the picker or the collector or finally the recycler. But again, also the market, because that product is ultimately going to come back to me again as a recycled content bottle or a, a bench or a, a piece of irrigation pipe. And, and the whole way for me as, as consumer involved in that value chain need to take into account that that product is in, in a circular economy. Soren, would you like to add to that? Sorry, I'll skip this one, thanks. No problem. Uh, then there have been a few other um, comments that say uh, we need to focus on education and, and tackle plastics that end up in rivers and streams before it lands up on beaches um, and, and how this relates to infrastructure. Um, my question is, how do we trap uh, in international resources uh, to help the African problem? Um, most funding is focused uh, or sorry, most funding is not focused or made available. Would anyone like to comment? I have one comment because, of course, I think it's very, as I said, it's, it's very important that we educate the next generation. Having said that, you know, sometimes when you see pictures where you, you have trucks and lorries that just dump everything into the rivers, ending up in the sea, then, of course, it's very difficult to learn the next generation how important it is that uh, he doesn't uh, throw one bottle. And then they see, you know, 20 trucks coming up to the same area and just uh, dump it into the river. So we also have to... I mean, we have to uh, recognize that we, we need also to put pressure is, is a bad word because I'm, I'm, we are not going to fret something, but we, we, we need to tell governments, you know, that this is also part of good governance, that you don't do those things. And if you want to be part of, you know, the international society, you want to be, uh, you want to receive money for development, this is also part of it because... At the end of the day, the ocean be belongs to all of us, and 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 and, and uh, there's so so much to do, and it's not only in, in Africa. I know that it's also happening in other places in the world, but uh, I mean, we must stop using it as a, a, a dump place uh, just because you can't see it; it's still there. <clears throat> um, Anabi, um, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, uh, education is is important. Um, and do we start with the first generation or the now generation or the baby boomers, whoever? I think just everyone needs to be aware that um, we can't just continue creating. Um, and and I don't want to only talk about plastic waste, but but general waste. Um, and I agree with with Soren. Quite often, uh, the oceans and the river are seen as as a way of dealing with my waste because if I pump it in there, it disappears. Uh, um, and I know it's not a topic for close to lunch, but if I just look at stuff people chuck down toilets and and wastewater systems because it gets flushed away and I don't have to worry about it. Um, so uh, the whole thing of, of education and training is right across. Everyone needs to understand the consequences of our actions. Uh, thank you, Annabee. Uh, welcome back, Chris. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we can move on to a few other questions. Uh, some were directed specifically uh, for you, Chris, that say, um, hi, Chris, great presentation. Regarding the recycling of plastic into building materials and roads, how well are these materials tested for their structural integrity? Um, and what are the risks of microplastic generation from e.g. plastic roads? Thanks. Yes, thanks. Um, plastic roads have been contentious for, for a long time. Um, I, I think we've got to put it into context. We need to understand that most of the microplastics that come off of roads have got nothing to do with plastic. It's the tires um, that crumb and, and wear off the roads, and we keep forgetting about that. Um, in terms of plastics, there are different technologies. So, so what we're seeing is that the, the dry melt system, is, as I mentioned in my presentation, 
there have been issues, but not with all plastics. So dry melt is fine for polyolefins, but as soon as you use anything with, uh, with polyethylene to reflate, um, that creates a, um, uh, creates a microfiber, but that can be resolved using um, uh, cross-linking polymers uh, or polymer agents. The hot melt system is, uh, I think, a little bit more exciting because it allows us to use a lot more different types of plastic and a lot more um, uh, wasteful or, or, or non-recyclable or unrecyclable plastics. And if we look at that in terms of roads, we would be able to use up to 60 tons of plastic per kilometer of road. We can get rid of a lot of plastic that way. So I think it certainly is an opportunity for the future. The, the issue again comes back to what I said before, it's legislation, compliance, um, uh, procurement, material specification. We've got to go through multiple hoops and jumps. Um, and uh, at the moment, the CSR is uh, busy working on, on uh, different applications to look at both the dry and hot melt type systems. Um, but we need to look at how we get these products into uh, specified material. We're, we're looking at the moment billions of rands going into the new N3, N2 upgrades. Um, how do we make sure that we get it in there now without going through two or three years of testing something? Um, the simple reality is, is, that, is that testing a, a road takes time, um, but it can be proven in terms of uh, laboratory analyses what that is, but we don't have a standard for it. So, so we've got to work with the roads agencies, we've got to work with the, our, our local systems uh, and get them into main um, applications as soon as possible. And I believe that can be done um, looking at, uh, rather than trying to, to target the sandrails, which you've got strict procurement processes to go through, uh, is to rather look at, uh, at smaller roads um, and, and um, back roads to start off with so that we can get that level of, of um, confidence uh, going forward. But, Remember, India's been doing it for years. Um, Scotland's been doing it for years. So that, that we need to also try and learn from other people instead of trying to reinvent and, and recertify everything ourselves. Um, it's been done. Why are we doing it again? Uh, thank you, Chris. There was a um, comment in the uh, chat box as well um, referring to um, plastic roads. Um, and that also asks about the issue for um, tiles um, made from tires. I don't know if you want to expand on that, or Anabi, if you would like, Anabi and Soren, if you would like to chime in as well. I think, I think the, the tiles, was that the tire ones that uh, I showed in my presentation? Yes, yes, I think it's referring to those, the yeah, tiles so made from tires. There's, there's different, different applications. Um, one can, can use a hot melt system from a crumbed rubber. So again, instead of uh, destruction of tires through, through uh, waste energy, one can look at a higher value. Again, uh, look up the value chain. Um, uh, we need to debeat it or take the metals out of it. Um, the metals have a value. And then crumbed products can literally be molded using polyurethanes or, or other binders into anything from a roof tile to matting systems, flooring systems. Um, we already use it for all of our international um, uh, athletics tracks uh, and those sort of things. It's all using recycled rubber. So um, the solutions are there um, and the applications are there. We just, we just need to put them into place. Um, there's gonna be launching just now is, is, the, um, is, is the new Holly Harvey tile system with 100% recycled material that's 100% recyclable. Let's promote stuff that's green. So there's opportunities. Anavi, did you want to comment on that? Um, no, just, just supporting it, that um, I do believe that there is opportunity in building materials for it. Um, I mean, there's, there's one company in, in Johannesburg that's um, compressing multi-layer materials. So even um, a packaging that contains aluminium foil um, can be with high pressure uh, pushed into sheeting and, and uh, which can be used for, for numerous uh, building applications. Um, and yeah, I agree with Chris, we often have legislation against us. Um, and, and my previous meeting this morning was where plastics is trying to replace a, a metal product for, for all the right reasons. It's lighter, more energy efficient, um, more economic to produce. Um, and the metal part is kicking back and saying, 
um, no ways. It can't be safe. Um, it's going to be toxic. It's going to absorb. Um, so yeah, we, we need to make sure that we're not creating another problem, but just to, to um, put barriers in place for these developments and finding solutions, it's, it's not helping either. Uh, thank you, Anabi. Um, Soren, um, if you would like to comment, please feel free to chime in. Yeah, the, this is really a tough one because, of course, those who produce the products we use today, they will do anything they can to prevent uh, new materials or new legislations uh, coming in. And we, we have to deal with that. And, and I think that might even be a bigger problem than we actually know because, uh, I mean, if we, we want to, to, to put a value on something that is... Uh, has no value today, of course, then you, 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 you push the market uh, in, a, in a way or, or you try to give an advances to, to those who solve the problem of the society, but the producers, they will not just, you know, sit and watch. So, so this might be something that also has to be addressed, at least at the political level. Thank you, Soren. Uh, there's another question that says, um, do you think that extended producer responsibility regulations that have been legislated will have an improvement in the plastic waste situation and by how much? Uh, Chris, would you like, sorry, Anabi, would you like to start us off? And then Chris I'll, and then Zora? I would start it off and hopefully my other um, two panelists can, can continue. Um, what he definitely done already so far is, is bringing the awareness quite close um, to everyone out there. Because right from the importer and the brand owner and the retailer and the consumer, which is all watching this legislation and the unfolding thereof saying, how is it going to impact on me? What will it differ for me? Um, it have definitely have made brand owners much more aware of, of the magnitude and the volumes of, of material they put into the market. Because for the first time, they actually questioned, you know, how many tons of polypropylene? How many tons of paper? How many tons of metal are you putting in the market? So for me, um, that, that is a big going ahead. Will it actually reduce plastic in the environment? Um, I'm not 100% convinced because as I said, uh, recycling alone is not going to help for that. Um, we need proper systems in place. Um, the EPR is, is spelling that out that we need to get involved in, in the collection of waste. Um, but but we'll need to to wait and see as well how that will unfold, and and hopefully Chris you can you can add a bit to this. My opinion really is to try and, and ensure that we start looking at this from a holistic uh, perspective that's going to drive a sustainable and a circular future. Um, the, the the reality is we're going to get EPRs and things handed on to to the consumer ultimately. I think I raised it in my, in my presentation. We've, uh, the industry has spent about $230 billion over the last five years to increase capacity in plastics production, and yet we're putting $5 billion um, annually into solving plastic waste problems. Um, we need to make sure that the drive starts looking at designing for recyclability, but also the big corporates need to put the money where the mouth is. Um, and when we're looking at solution development, um, you know, the, the, polluter pays or the producer pays type principle really needs to drive innovation and development. Um, what we've found over the last five, 10 years is, is that private sector is trying to drive innovation and development um, and being herded like a bunch of rabid kittens by, by industry. Um, you know, we need to make sure that there's a little bit more guidance and control in terms of supporting that local innovation and to make sure that we create those opportunities locally. So Let's get real about it. Um, EPR, it, it, it's not right at the moment. It, it's not never going to be right, but it, it's a step in the right direction. Um, we will learn from that um, and we will adapt it as we go along. But we need to look at making sure that, that we follow through that EPR in Africa or Southeast Asia is very different to Europe, um, where we have a, a much for bigger informal sector and we have a massive problem in terms of waste collection infrastructure. Um, and so we've got to look at those issues. Uh, if we don't, um, we, we, we can't try and, and manage everything just using one system. As you say, recycling is not just the answer. We've got to look at the entire value chain. Thank you, Chris. Um, Soren, would you like to comment on extended producer responsibility in Europe? 
No, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm covered by what has been said by Energy and Chris. I could just say that, of course, uh, this is, uh, this is, as I said before, the tough decision and uh, the tough discussions, because we, we, we cannot achieve our goals if we don't uh, do uh, or change the legislation uh, one way or another. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Soren. Uh, there's another question here in the Q&A box that says, is it possible to intervene into local municipality waste management uh, for businesses in South African context, for example, uh, to sort waste and recycle at an open dumped landfill site? Uh, Chris, would you like to comment first? It should be, yes, absolutely, it should be. Um, it, it's mandated in terms of the MFMA, in terms of the Waste Management Act, NEMWA, uh, that municipalities have a role to play, but we're, we're, not, we're not really seeing it. Um, I, I think a lot of it is given lip service. It needs to be done on a much bigger scale. Uh, but it's also supply and demand. The, the opportunity for municipalities is to create a demand for, for recycled products um, and, and applications, such as um, uh, yeah, building materials, um, street pole signs, um, uh, curb stones, etc. They can be manufactured from recycled materials. But engaging with the, the smaller guys is very difficult from an MFMA and a PFMA perspective in terms of the local municipal requirements. And, and we need to look at how we can change that. And, and I think the problem is, is that waste is considered um, a sectoral application in a municipality um, under sometimes community services, sometimes under infrastructure. Uh, waste should be seen as a multi-sectoral approach. It's, it's economic development, it's social development, it's environmental protection. Um, so you need to look at the getting out of this, this um, silo mentality where we're looking at waste as one key issue. There are so many different components to it. So when we look at transitioning, to a circular economy using waste as a resource. We cannot do it under the current um, system that we have because those silos and boxes don't talk to each other. So we need to open up those, op those um, uh, communication channels between them. We need to look at the economics, uh, the social, the, the environmental, um, and, and move away from our single mindset in terms of, of collect um, and dispose. We've, we've, got to, we've got to change uh, and, and that's gonna take time, I'm afraid. Thank you, Chris. Uh, would anyone like to add to this question? Um, All right. Oh. Just, a, yeah, just a quick comment and 100% and, uh, agree with, with Chris and the, the silo mentality. And, um, but I think we, we know that our municipalities are, are lacking resources. Um, they're lacking skills. They're lacking a whole lot of willpower, I think, as well. Um, and and maybe we, we should put as, as communities more pressure on them to, to do what they're supposed to be doing. Thank you, Annabi. Uh, there's another question in the chat box that says, uh, China has stopped accepting US waste plastic. Um, apparently this waste is now being sold to poor African countries where corrupt governments accept this waste with no plan on how to manage or dispose of it. Uh, this is exploitation at a global level. Um, what can be done about this? Yeah, I, I think that should be looked upon in a, a UN level. I mean, uh, if 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 the, if you if there's no proper management of the waste you export to whoever it is, then I, I think it's uh, it shouldn't be kind of legal. I mean, we have to make sure that it's done in the right way. It shouldn't just be like this. You just pay to get rid of your problem, and it end up in your backyard anyway. Because at the end of the day, it will just uh, land on U.S. Uh, coasts. Uh, just 10 years later. So, so this should be uh, at the highest level, I think, if we should uh, deal with this problem. Thank you. No, no, and I think the Basel Convention, um, which started to include plastic mixed waste under, under the hazardous waste is, is supposedly addressing that. But we also know that the whole enforcement um, of, of laws in, in a corrupt society is, is very difficult. But, but I agree with you, Soren, it, it needs to be addressed also on, on the, the countries where there is law to make sure that they, they're not um, abusing the system. Uh, thank you, Soren and Annabee. Um, 
I think we have time for uh, one last question um, before we wrap things up today. Um, I see a few people have raised the issue of uh, organic waste um, in uh, heading to landfills and things like that. Uh, would anyone like to comment um, on, on ways to manage manage this or, or ways that is managed in other countries? I'm happy to add to that. I think that, that we've got to realize and understand that uh, across Africa, and I, and I think our first presenter showed that about 57% on average is organics. Um, it's a huge issue that we need to look at um, and one that we're, we're doing miserably at. Um, I always cite Durban as a prime example where we have source separation and blue bags for garden waste uh, and garden refuse centers, and we're actually separating a green waste. And then we go and throw it in the landfill. Um, so we need to understand circular economy and looking at different applications in organics. The reality is, is that everyone thinks composting and, and, and it's complicated and where are we gonna do the composting and it's a low value product. But there are opportunities in terms of um, diversifying that. So one could look at vermiculture, one could look at anaerobic digestion. There's ethanol production from uh, organics. There are systems for biochar production that can then create uh, bioorganic fertilizers and, and opportunities. Um, there are direct energy applications using biomass. Um, we need to unpack all of the different components. Um, we have the systems in place in places like, um, like Durban where we are separating already. So why are we not investigating these systems? And we've been talking about this for 20 years as far as I remember and still nothing has happened. Um, but then we also need to understand our, our large scale organic wastes. Um, we have a lot of production waste, we have a lot of um, uh, 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 agricultural waste uh, and forestry waste. And there are huge potential opportunities from that. So we need to bring these technologies into play and add value to these waste streams. Um, and they can all create jobs. Um, we're, just, we're just not doing it. Yeah, and, and um, wearing my plastics recycling hat, um, I agree with, with one of the comments in, in the chat box that it does contaminate the plastics. Um, and if we're already separating it like in Durban, we can create that. It, there are so many opportunities for organic um, waste materials and it, it will definitely help the recyclability of, of the non-organic stream. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Annaby. There's one last question here in the chat box, and then I think we'll wrap things up for today. Uh, the last question is, uh, waste segregation at source has been tested in small island developing states in the last two decades, but it does not seem to pick up or become successful at a national level. Uh, are there any lessons that can be learned from other mainland or SIDS countries? Thank you. Um, maybe I can add to that. I think the lessons that need to be learned are understanding that, that if we don't have the infrastructure that is capable of processing the waste, then um, we're spending good money, we're throwing good money after bad. Uh, it's been highlighted in South Africa, it's been highlighted in most of the island states. Um, we need to look at the technological interventions. So um, some of the work we're doing at the moment with, um, with Reunion, Mauritius, uh, Seychelles, uh, Hawaii and the Bahamas, uh, is looking at the local resources uh, with regards to understanding that there are greater opportunities um, looking at, at energy harvesting, um, infrastructural product development, um, things like the ocean paver on the island states uh, obviously ties into uh, global warming and climate change with um, coastal erosion increasing in island states. So there are many different ways of doing it, but it's a supply and demand issue. And, and, and this is the problem is that there's no quick fix. Um, we need to create the infrastructure to be able to process the materials that are collected. If we don't look at a system where we have vertical integration um, across the value chain, what tends to happen is, is that if you look at the source separation in South Africa, 50% uh, of the materials are of little to no value that are collected by the source separation bag. And those end up um, you know, a double handling fee and then end up in landfill because we're not processing them. Um, so we're focusing on the PET and the aluminum cans and the cardboard and the high value stuff. And, and we're not focusing on the entire waste stream. So systems and resources have to put in place to look at all of the recyclable wastes. Um, you know, if, the, if there's no market for it, um, we are creating additional cost by looking at source separation. So we've got to look at the entire spectrum of, uh, of applications from collection to, to processing. 
thank you, Chris. Um, would any of the, um, Annabi Soren, would you like to add anything before we hand over to um, Anton Hanakom from Plastics SA to wrap things up? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Um, I'll, I'll give Anton a bit more time. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris, Annabi, and Soren. Um, it's been wonderful to listen to you today. Uh, we're now going to hand over to Anton Hanakom from Plastics SA just to um, say some, share some closing words with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Tara, and, and a big thank you to all the panel members. Um, you had good presentations, and I think you give us a lot of food for thought at the end of the day. I, I think this is a very um, difficult discussion as well, and there's so many different ideas and opinions uh, that one needs to have platforms like this to, to really bring it together. So I think today was a good start to bring the North and the South together, uh, together in a a collaborative forum where we can discuss and, and can highlight uh, specific issues. And, and I'm not going to try and summarize what, what's been said so far, but maybe a few key things that, that stood out for me was uh, that Africa is important for, for the world. Um, you can probably look at it on a positive side or a negative side, uh, but, but Africa has been the dumping ground for waste for, for many decades, um, which obviously had a negative impact on the environmental economic and the social benefits of the country or of the continent. Um, and Africa really needs support and assistance to change this impact. And some of the things that's been mentioned was change of culture of littering, improve education and awareness. I think that came up quite a number of times, the development of infrastructure and new markets, and the need to improve on waste management or separation at source. Um, all of these things obviously need to be done with evidence-based um, information decision-making at the end of the day. We definitely need a lot of investment. Um, and, and I think Chris mentioned that we need to get real around this and specifically for producers as well. So we need to change the narrative that, that plastics is not just waste, but it is a resource and we need to see it as a resource uh, going forward. Important to me is that we should look more than at not just recycling, but also at the suite of solutions uh, that can be implemented to deal with, with plastic waste in the environment. So listening to the panel members, there seems to be a lot of agreements on, on many things. Um, and I think we need to continue this debate. Um, but even better, let's start um, working together uh, to find solutions and to start implementing solutions uh, that was fit for Africa. So from my side, thank you very much and enjoy the afternoon session as well. Tara, I'm not sure uh, if there's any admin arrangements for this afternoon session. Uh, thank you, Anton. Um, no, there are no further um, admin points for this afternoon, um, but we will be starting the second session at uh, three o'clock GMT plus two, uh, which I believe is 2 p.m. in Europe. Um, but I, I stand under correction. Um, so if anyone would like to register for the second session, you can find um, the registration link on either of the um, websites listed here, either the Plastics SA, Waste Free Oceans or SST events page. Um, thank you so much, everyone. We look forward to seeing you in this afternoon session. Um, and again, a special thank you to our panelists. Um, we're very grateful to have you with us today. <laughs>